Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to those who are joining us via live streaming as well. We are, uh, this is the panel discussion about investing for impact. I'm your host, my name is Sally Bundock. I'm a, a presenter and journalist with BBC World News. So what a week it's been. <laughs> Many of you have said to me already, I'm exhausted, but it's been a great week. It's been a great week. You don't know if it's the morning or the evening or the afternoon. It's just rolling around. And we still have so much to come, don't we, with that speech this afternoon. So uh, I've had many conversations this week with company bosses, with delegates, politicians. There has been a lot of discussion this week, and I know there's been a lot of panels here as well, about how to do business, trade, invest in a way uh, that has the right impact on people and on the environment. Now, normally I get about three minutes with my guests on live television. We've got one hour, so we can really dig deep into this topic. And I'm hoping that with my fantastic panel here, that it will be extremely practical as well. And it won't be so much about uh, theory, but it will be about Hi. what's going on already in practice and, and what we can do better in the future. So let me introduce you to uh, the panel, starting with uh, the gentleman next to me, Prime Minister, actually, Prime Minister of Denmark, uh, Lars Luk Rasmussen. It's great to have him with us this morning. Then next to uh, him, we have got uh, Chetna Sinha. Uh, Chetna is founder and chair of the Mandeshi Foundation in India, but also I'm sure you're well aware that she is one of the co-chairs of this year's World Economic Forum as well. Then next to uh, Chetna, we've got Akinwumi Ayodeji Adesina, who's president of the African Development Bank. And then last but by no means least, we have Philip Hildebrand, who is vice chairman of BlackRock. So welcome to all the panelists. So what we're grappling with is how do we unlock capital to scale social and environmental impact and accelerate progress on sustainable development goals. I'm sure we're all agreed uh, in the room that we do need uh, concerted collective action given the current context that we're seeing around the world at the moment. Just to give you an idea of, of where we are, a BGC report out recently says there's roughly 23 trillion US dollars in general in socially responsible investing at the moment with about nine trillion uh, US dollars of this in sustainable investments more specifically. When it comes to the size of the impact investing market, it's actually quite difficult to pinpoint that and come to a conclusion, but it can range sort of between 60 and 200 uh, billion dollars. So impact investing does depend on who you ask, but obviously there's various reports out there that try and estimate what's going on in the world at the moment. So if we begin, I'm gonna ask Philip to start with, just to talk about some of the different types of investment out there, different types of vehicles for investment that do have a social impact. Because Philip, there are various different ways of doing this, aren't there? Yes, uh, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, this is a very important topic. Uh, let me just say first, I think three things are coming together that are creating, uh, I believe, a tremendous window of opportunity here in the space of impact investing. The first one is there are now an increasing number of serious empirical studies that are beginning to show that the old story that by doing good you lose on profitability, that that may not be true. Now, I want to say it's early days. I think a lot more work needs to be done in this space. But in the last couple of years, we've seen some very serious studies, a big meta study that looked at uh, huge kind of 2,000 research papers, a few things at Harvard, a couple of industry studies that are beginning to show that they may not be a negative trade-off uh, if you focus your investments uh, around sustainability goals broadly defined. Uh, indeed, some of these studies are beginning to show that what probably seems intuitive for many of you, that there could be a positive trade-off if you think of it in terms of the longer term. We refer to this as sustained financial performance. So this is a big development. If we can begin to show that sustained financial performance increases 
by incorporating sustainability um, dimensions into your investment products or strategies, that's a game changer. The second thing I'd want to mention is we have the largest wealth transfer about to take place or taking place as we speak generation, intergenerationally that we've ever seen in the history of humanity. <coughs> uh, it is clear to me when you look at, at clients that this new generation that is inheriting this enormous wealth has evolved in terms of uh, its own social values um, and what it wants to see happen with its money. This again I think can be an enormous sort of game changer in a sense in terms of an, evolve, an evolution if you like of social uh, values. And the third one that gives me hope is that technology here from an, as an investment manager, as an asset manager, it is very clear that technology today helps us uh, do this, pursue these sustainability goals in investing uh, in much more efficient ways than we could have done even two, three, five, let alone 10 years ago. So these three things together, I think, are creating uh, an industry that is being pushed both by the kind of supply side and the demand side. Clients demand more of it, technology allows us to do more of it, and finally, uh, if it is indeed true, and the evidence is pointing in this direction, that at least if you think of it in the longer term, there is not a negative opportunity cost. Indeed, there may well be positive uh, effects on performance if you do that. Then it's a very, very powerful kind of threefold dynamic that is unfolding here. Uh, in terms of what the different things we have, you know, it's essentially the famous ESG. Uh, this is the way the industry thinks of it today. So you have three dimensions. One of them is incorporating environmental goals into it. The other one is incorporating societal goals into it. Here we're thinking of things like diversity. And, uh, and then the third one, uh, which is very important in the corporate world, is incorporating governance uh, dimensions into your investment strategies. Again, here you'd be looking at how companies are governed, how boards are organized, etc. So it's a, it's a very broad world. Impact investing, in a sense, is a sort of meta terminology that covers all of it. I think for the sake of this discussion, it's probably useful uh, if we kind of take this industry standard that has now emerged, uh, ESG, when we think of the various ways in which one can express uh, goals that reach beyond uh, the financial side. But I, I just want to say to conclude that it's important not to separate too much these goals from the financial side. Because if it is true that in fact incorporating these goals enhances sustained financial performance, then we have come over the biggest hurdle historically, namely this assumption or this presumption that by doing good, you generate less of a financial return. And this has been, I believe, the biggest obstacle in a way to move this agenda forward. But do you believe, though, that, that that barrier, as it were, that perception um, is, is becoming less and less? Because this is a conversation that's been ha being had for quite some time, isn't it? Um, I sort of first learned about it about 10 years ago when I came across uh, an organization that was just doing <coughs> financial research and reports on uh, projects on around the world so that investors could see you know, the reward, the financial reward uh, of investing in these projects as opposed to just the feeling warm inside that you're doing some good in the world and actually you're throwing, you know, money at it but getting nothing in return other than the feeling of doing good. I yes, mean, things I think, have changed for some time. I think they're changing very rapidly and the reason they're changing uh, is simply because these studies are emerging. Technology is allowing us to measure <coughs> things differently. Um, the financial crisis, you know, paradoxically has helped as well because the crisis showed that if you only focus on nominal sort of short-term rates of return on equity, it's really a meaningless concept because a bank might create 25% rate of return on equity, but then it blows up and, and you have a huge kind of damage from it. So I think we learned in the crisis that we need to think in terms of risk-adjusted returns. So this has helped elevate this debate and the data that is now emerging from these studies I think is rapidly changing the way people think about it. I could give you lots of data, I don't want to do that, but take my word for it, many of you know this, there is increasing evidence 
uh, that if you think of this in the longer term, there is no cost involved in terms of financial return. And Al Gore yesterday quoted some statistics. I have a bunch here. There's a big study that was done at Harvard recently. Uh, I'm optimistic. You know, now, if it turns out that these studies are wrong and there is a financial cost to it, even in the longer term, then it becomes an issue of societal norms and values. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest this way. But at the moment, I tell you that when I look at the evidence that is emerging, my, I'm not the scientist here, but my guess is that we will end up in a pretty good place where the data actually underpins the idea that you can create sustained value by incorporating these dimensions into your investment products and strategies. And you'll notice here on the panel, we've, we've got all the stakeholders here. So we've got investment finance, We've got Development Bank. We have uh, Chetna, who's running a fund that's doing a lot of this already. And we have uh, government represented with a, with a prime minister. So if you sort of think about all the stakeholders that you need to be involved in this process for it to work, for it to be successful, we kind of have them all represented here. Uh, prime Minister, do tell us about how you've been uh, implementing you know, social impact investment in Denmark in order to see significant change in the environment when it comes to the climate. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I, first of all, thank you for having me. And then I would like to say that I totally agree with you. There's a, a good reason to be optimistic about all this, uh, because there's a very good business case out there. Um, I mean, now we have adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, um, and we reached an agreement in Paris. Uh, and now we have to deliver. And of course, it comes with a multi-trillion uh, US dollar price tag. But it also comes with a lot of good business opportunities. And from a Danish point of view, I mean, we have managed to decouple economic growth from uh, uh, any increase in energy consumption during the last three decades. So we have a lot of skills uh, in, in this area when it comes to renewable energy, uh, wastewater management, etc., etc. And our businesses uh, want to uh, reach out. So what we need to do is to deliver a framework because what they also want is predictability. So that's why we have uh, taken two initiatives. Um, first of all, we are going uh, very soon to establish an SDG fund in close cooperation with the pension funds in Denmark. Just explain SDG fund the for those who don't understand. The Sustainable Development Goals. Sure. Yeah. So it's a fund in order to uh, to, to reach these uh, very important goals uh, adopted in, in, in UN two years ago. And, uh, and uh, it is uh, a cooperation between the, the government and the Danish pension funds. I mean, the interest rate is low uh, right now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, funding possibilities and there's a lot of patience uh, in our pension funds. So they are willing uh, to invest in this. And we expect on a basis of uh, one billion uh, basis to uh, to uh, to uh, invest in projects uh, equivalent to uh, like five billion uh, US dollars. So that's one important initiative. And how did how did that collaboration begin between government and pension funds in Denmark? It was a governmental initiative. Uh, I mean, because I had the honor to uh, to, to to chair the uh, UN General Assembly when we adopted these SDGs, and it has been a cross-party uh, Danish uh, priority for many years to push this agenda. And, and that's, would you argue that's why it's been successful? Because you've kind of taken the bull by the horns. And yeah, I would say so. you've got cross-party support yeah, yeah, for yeah, it, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you've pushed it. Yes, of course. I mean, when an election campaign is coming up, I would argue that there's a huge difference between me and the opposition. <laughs> but, of but, course you would. <laughs> yeah, but, but in reality, I mean, Denmark is a consensus society. And in this uh, field of, of, of taking on international respon responsibility in this sustainable uh, agenda, there's a broad alliance in the Danish parliament. So it was very easy to take this initiative. And uh, on the top of few taxpayers' money, uh, invite uh, the social partners to add up uh, in, 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 in top of that. So we are going to launch, launch this uh, SDG fund very soon. And another important initiative is uh, the new uh, international framework called P4G, uh, Partnering for uh, Global Goals and Green Growth, uh, which we launched during the last UN General Assembly. And until now, we have uh, eight other countries on board, uh, among them Ethiopia and Africa, but also countries as Vietnam, Mexico, 
uh, South Korea, etc. Uh, and the C40 network, uh, which consists of the 92 biggest cities around the world. Uh, and just yesterday, I signed up with WEF, uh, a memorandum of, of uh, understanding. And, and the idea behind this is exactly the same, to encourage governments to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, describe uh, a concrete strategy in order to reach out for, for for fulfilling these goals and, and bring private companies involved. And, and just briefly, before I bring in others in the conversation, when you go about that, trying to encourage other governments mm. to follow suit, what is the response like? Is there momentum elsewhere? I think there's a not? momentum because so many there are so many good arguments behind this. And I mean, if you're not a believer in the climate agenda, and uh, we are going to listen to the American president later today, then you could, then you could uh, reach out for, for other arguments. I mean, if you look at Europe right now, there's this uh, refugee pressure in Europe mm -hmm. uh, and uh, migration pressure. And uh, so in, even if you are not a true believer in the SDGs, it is in our own best self-interest to unlock the huge potential in Africa in order to, to solve what, 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 what is happening right, right now with this pressure in Europe. So whether it's the environment or just being idealistic about things or be pragmatic about the pressure in Europe, you could choose any road and it will lead to the same uh, conclusion that we need to invest more in Africa to unlock the potential. Well, let's bring it back in, and he's, he's sitting forward and listening intently. <laughs> uh, he's saying, yes, I completely agree with that. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, give us your take on this conversation and your experience in Africa. I mean, our lead story this morning on BBC World News was the chronic drought in South Sudan and, and the difficulties there and the, the need that they have there. That's just one part. Yeah, well, I think that the, for me, it's, I don't see any investment that one would make that's not impact related. We can talk about whether it's blended finance, whether it is social impact investing, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, we have to really understand that when we're investing, we're investing for collective good. And investing for collective good means that some of the things that you mentioned, the environment matters. We all live on the planet. We have to make sure that that works. The second one is that we have to make sure that there's social impact, you know, because I was saying about the economic growth rates in Africa, we have projected this year that it's going to be 4.1% GDP growth rate. Okay, tough love, what does that really mean? You know, nobody eats GDP. I really have to work and make sure we can lift millions of people out of poverty. But to do that, we need to be able to get financing to do a number of things, access to power. 645 million Africans today don't have access to electricity. And so solving that problem is fundamental to how you get, so, uh, you know, sustained uh, growth uh, on the continent. You have, you were talking about the whole issue of malnutrition and stunting. You know, you've got 54 million kids in Africa that are stunted. So if you have stunted economies today, I mean, children today, you're going to have stunted economies tomorrow. So we've got to find a way in which we finance this. So for us as a bank, we set up as a development, we're a development finance institution. So all we do is all about impact, right? And we take social issues very important. Uh, we think uh, environmental issues are very important. Let me give you some examples for us. We invest about $10 billion a year, and it goes into all kinds of sectors, energy, infrastructure, waters, sanitation, and things like that. But for us, the real issue is the issue of con how you blend concessional finance with commercial finance. So if you want to really do something that is going to lead to a significant amount of impact, you have to ask, how do I reduce the risk? How do I price in such a way that that investment would normally or call from the, from the commercial side if you blend it with uh, 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 commercial uh, financing. And we've been doing that. I want to talk about <coughs> one particular issue, which is how do you provide that kind of financing, say, for dealing with the issue of nutrition, which also the Prime Minister was alluding to that. We think that it's important to flow today nutrition social impact bonds that will allow us to be able to raise money off the capital markets and use our AAA rating to bring that money in and then we can blend that finance for countries to be able to front load critically important investment in nutrition. Because for nutrition, for me, it's all about the, the brain, right? It's all about the grain matter, right? I can fix road, I can fix rail, I can fix anything else. But I can't fix a brain cell when it's dead, okay? And so it's about how do you invest optimally in nutrition 
It's not obvious to a commercial sector that they will do that, but we believe from the development side that we'll do that. So floating um, uh, nutrition social impact bond, it's one that we want to, uh, to do. The other one that I want to mention has to Sorry, be... Sorry, can I just interject yeah, there sure. for a moment? Um, you know, you mentioned this social impact bond. You say you want to do that. It sounds like, you know, you just throw it out there. How, how near are you to, to seeing that happen or how easy or difficult will it be to make that happen? Well, first and foremost is that we have facilities that can credit enhance any country that goes <coughs> onto the market to borrow money to actually do those bonds. And so as a bank, we think that we need to scale up investment for nutrition. We need to support private sector that is actually doing uh, you know, high energy foods in Africa. But they need access to finance at a lower interest rate than they would normally get for that kind of a thing. So that's the role of a commercial um, uh, development bank like ours. We can provide that kind of blended finance for that to happen. Uh, but I was also going to say something about the uh, issue of um, um, uh, women. So when we talk about social impact investment, and you look at Africa, for example, uh, women are the ones that don't have access to finance. So 95%, almost 90, 90, 90, 95% of the farmers in Africa are women but they don't have access to finance. So we set up this fund that is called Affirmative Finance Action for Women uh, in Africa with the goal of mobilizing $3 billion specifically for women in Africa. So we want to de-risk the financial markets to lend more to women. We want to also use blended finance to make sure that they can get access to... And just explain what blended finance is yeah, for those so, who don't so understand. So blended finance for us is you take commercial finance, which is we, we have a commercial arm of the bank, we also have a concessionary part of the bank. So we take that concessionary part of our money and we blend it with the, the commercial side so that your weighted access uh, rate, interest rate goes down yeah. to be able to make those investments. And I think that that is critical if you're going to do anything that will have social impact because the private sector will not normally do things like water, sanitation, uh, investing in youth unless you make it easier for them to be able to have access to finance at a lower interest rate. Okay, Chetna, let's bring you in at this point um, because you are kind of across the board in India. You, you have a fund where you're raising the finance, but you're actually seeing it implemented and seeing projects outworked, which are having a social impact. So just talk us through your experience of practical ways, ways that have worked where you've raised the funds, it's been channeled in the right place, and it's, it's having the impact. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to share that, I mean, I've started a women's bank. And why bank and not my <coughs> MFI? Because one thing was very clear that women wanted to do savings. Rural women were in the remote locations. They wanted to do savings. And another thing is that to provide them access to finance at a lower rate. So that they can, I mean, they can increase their business in a much more profitable way. So that bank actually did not get any support from outside. It's a homegrown bank. I will share a story of women uh, who came to the bank and she mortgaged gold to take loan. I asked her, why are you taking loan? She said that you don't realize there's such a bad drought and I am mortgaging my gold to buy a fodder for my animals. And then she added that before drought used to happen, but there was, water was there. The problem was employment. But now when drought happens, there is no water. And she asks me the question that can I mortgage gold and get water? I had no answer. And I am telling exactly the brain that the, their brain, it is so important to understand that their brains are working on sustainable development goals, but our brains are still a bit lazier in going to those areas. And she was asking the right question. So we started a cattle camp, we started investing in water, but now I'm coming to the thing which you mentioned about the fund. So this is, these are the women from whom I've learned so much. And we started the bank, it is a 20 years bank with no outside support. Women are running with all these animals, conserving water, everything. And the investment in microfinance industry is huge. In India, we have $20 billion industry. It, makes, it gives access to finance to women, very costly. Investors make a lot of money, yes. But why women are empowered? Because they are paying high interest and proving themselves 
repaying in time so that investors get their money back. So it's a, actually women are much more smarter in achieving those goals. Now I come to the third thing, which actually from the same women who wanted to go to the second stage of finance where they made very clear, we don't want this costly access to finance. So then why not, that, that was the time we thought that they need affordable finance for micro enterprise in rural area, why not start a fund? And that's how I started an alternative investment fund, which is a debt financing. We registered at Stock Exchange Board of India. So from Reserve Bank, our women went to Stock Exchange Board for setting up the micro enterprise. And this fund is a debt financing. I'm just telling a little bit of, like it, it will provide loans through the institution to these women to go to the second level of micro enterprise. And if these women, they success, they are going to the, I mean, if we have a rural micro enterprise in rural India, the jobs are going to create for youth, that is one. Second, the pressure on agriculture population is going to reduce. So I have created a 1 billion rupee fund and launched here for our women. And it's actually matching with sustainable development goals. But still, I would like to say that credibility goes to those women who are taking the risk, who are paying the high interest, showing it the success, and showing it the path. Now I would just come to the second part. There are some obstacles also which we need to understand. And I would just like to say about the research what is available on these issues as far as environment, global warming. We do talk about this. I will again share another story, which actually was, I was just, I mean, it was so startling that we, one of a partner organization in Assam, Northeast India, they run a cocoon bank which means that women who are conserving cocoons, who are silk weavers, and they create a bank of cocoons and earn their income. Now these women were saying that our cocoons, the silkworm is dying before in the cocoon, and we don't know why. These women are tribal women. They have never done any carbon emissions. They have never flew. They have never got into the cars, nothing. But Today, in the jungles where they are collecting the cocoons, their cocoons are dying and they don't know why they are dying. But it is a very clear indication, and they are losing their income. Mm. So it is a very clear indication that this is the global warming which is affecting the last mile. And we don't even have information of that. Mm. I mean, I, I had no idea. And then I, I started talking to my colleagues, like, see the, how global warming is affecting. Yeah. So it is so important to understand this. Unless we understand, then again, we can bring the capital into it. And I would just like to say that, you know, there are innovative ways we can get the capital into it. And people, I mean, again, you made a very right point that you don't lose. I'm not even talking of trade of collective good. What I'm saying is that microfinance investors have gone, gotten so much of money. Mm. Women have empowered them you will get the returns. In our alternative investment fund, which we are having for our micro women enterprise, we have three categories. Those who do not want to lose their returns, fine, come, invest, get both, get your returns, and sleep well at night because you are investing in our women. Do that, okay. Those who are ready to have an impact investment, come together, we'll create an ecosystem for these women We'll have a business clinics for them. We'll have a investment clinics for them. We'll create, we'll provide the access to knowledge to these women. And private capital is not just unlocking capital and investing. Investing is one part. But creating those uh, business clinic and knowledge for these communities, and they know how to conserve. I, I mean, I'm just humbled how women, they, they talked about water and animals. So they know it's a matter of us to listening to them. And as far as capital innovation are concerned, those things we can work out if we have a data. But the most important thing when the solution comes, we can invest in capital, we can get the return. But if we don't listen to them, we, everybody lose. So I, at the end, I would just say that our women are so ambitious, they are not talking about going beyond poverty. They always say that we don't have, we don't want poor solutions to poor people. No. They talk of wealth creation, wealth generation, and not of individual wealth. 
wealth of society. Now, let's bring you in, uh, in the audience. Do you have questions or comments or even perhaps something you've seen work somewhere that you think is, is, you know, is worth sharing in this environment now? <coughs> if you've got a question for the panel, please obviously show your hand and then when you've got the microphone, please tell me what your, your name is and where you're from and then what your question or comment is. If there's any out there, I know it's always, here we go, this gentleman here. Oh, two, in fact. All right. We start here. And if you could say who your question is for as well, that would be great. My, my question is broad. I'm Rich Fuller from Pure Earth. My question is broadly to the panel. I'm wondering whether you're seeing any impact of pollution in the investment portfolios that you're concerned about and whether the toxics agenda, not just carbon, but also the toxics agenda, air pollution or soil and chemicals, are they showing up anywhere in your considerations at the moment? Who would like to respond to that? Maybe I can yeah. have a crack at this. So um, on the demand side, in, in other words, what are clients asking? Um, what we've seen in the last couple of years is a rapid acceleration of sort of customization of what kind of exposure somebody would like to have. And this again, technology here plays a big role because with the new, uh, particularly in the passive space, with the new investment products where you can screen, you can you know, take certain exposures out of it, and we can generate these new products at relatively low cost, what we are seeing is it, you know, it used to start with fairly straightforward, kind of what you would expect. I don't want any, I want you to screen my investment exposure through a product that, for instance, takes out uh, weapon manufacturing. That's a fairly classic one. Uh, another classic one, you've seen the Norgus Fund, the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, has uh, basically said we're not going to invest anymore in, in any oil um, production. So. They have essentially screened their portfolio or eliminated um, any investments in companies that are in this industry. Um, and what we're now beginning to see is because these new uh, ETFs and other passive products make it possible, you're starting to see much more tailor-made uh, desires being expressed for eliminating certain things. So I would call this the kind of first second generation of investment products. First, you had very simple screening uh, demands, and now you're beginning to see more tailor-made, fairly specific wishes that are being expressed and that can be replicated or produced fairly easily t uh, in terms of technology. So air pollution, again, is one such example where you could see clients that say, I want to invest, uh, but I want to make sure that I'm not invested in any, um, any heavy polluters, for instance, right? Uh, apart from the, the CO2 emission story. So this is now, it's beginning to be possible. Now, we still need to have some scale. We still need to have some pro profitability in order to produce um, such a new ETF. If this ETF is go only gonna be bought up by one person, it may not be economically feasible. But because the cost of producing these investment products has gone down so much, uh, it is now becoming much easier to kind of come up with very innovative and very targeted specific uh, products that can reflect these uh, desires. So for instance, if a pension fund comes and says, we'd like to have exposure to the equity markets in Europe, because we like Europe right now, but we'd like you to screen uh, any heavy polluters of a, of a specific substance out of that, provided you know, there's enough money going into this product so we can produce it at scale, that is now possible. And so this is why I think technology here has really been a big game changer in the investment industry. And this is only the beginning. You know, cost, as, as with everything in technology, cost declines very rapidly. And so as cost declines, you can, you can create much more tailor-made uh, solutions. Can I just ask you as well, um, on the demand side, do you find that clients come to you with their requests for, say, a social impact investment? Do they have specific issues in mind usually? Do they come to you and say, actually, it's, it's climate that I'm, I'm interested in, or actually, it's, it's poverty in Africa or whatever? Yeah, I would say it's twofold. It's, uh, you have certain clients that have very clear ideas 
they've studied this closely. They have an investment committee that has reached certain conclusions of what they want. And then it's really a matter of meeting their demands. Mm -hmm. And this is where often technology plays an important role. You have other types of clients who are perhaps at an earlier stage in their evolution who say, you know, we really care about this, but we don't really know yet what to do. What are our options? What can we do? Given the amount of money we want to invest, what is feasible economically? You know, we don't want to have fees that get so high that we can't afford it anymore. And, and so with those types of clients, you really enter into a dialogue and try to find creative solutions. Now, we as an industry are also still at the beginning in many ways of being able to offer creative solutions on this. So this is, you know, I would say this is, we are in sort of the second inning, to take a baseball analogy, uh, both in terms of the sophistication that comes or the, the specificity of the demands that comes from the clients, as well as the ability of the investment industry to really create um, adequate solutions for these demands. But it has, I can tell you one thing that in the last two years, the change both in terms of the clients and the change, the sort of wake up call in the industry to say this is actually a big commercial opportunity. We have to respond to it. There's also a sort of macro level, which in the presence of the Prime Minister, you know, I, I think it's worth mentioning, um, and President Macron actually made specific reference to this, very important in his speech two days ago. It is also increasingly becoming clear that if you pursue this at a country level and you incentivize this type of behavior, say for your pension funds, uh, there is a sort of an additional gain from this, namely that it looks like you're going to enhance the competitiveness of your country. I don't think it's a coincidence that when you look at the latest competitiveness scores, and again, we can argue you know, how accurate they are, uh, the World Econo Economic Forum does one itself, it's not a coincidence, I think, that the Nordic European countries come out being, in many ways, the most competitive uh, countries now in the world. Uh, I believe there's a link to this as well, that not only is there hopefully no trade-off from a financial performance perspective at the individual level, but if a country initiates the right policies that incentivizes this type of behavior, uh, that you may also have a sort of second win, namely that the level of your country, you can increase your competitiveness. This was a core uh, kind of message for Europe uh, from President Macron yesterday, two days ago, which I think is very important. And the experience that we're seeing, um, the data that is emerging out of the Nordic countries, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think very much underlines this notion that there's a competitiveness gain here too. So uh, there are, as you can see, there are many dimensions, the client, the investment industry, um, and um, governments in terms of policies, whether it's um, you know, regulatory policy or tax policy that can kind of be the, uh, create the right incentives. I think on the whole, what I see the European story here in terms of demands from clients is very, very rapidly moving as reflected by President Macron's speech two days ago. Prime Minister, would you like to respond to that before we... No, but I, I totally on? agree. I totally agree. Uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, the social cohesion in our society model, uh, the flexibility, security, uh, that people trust uh, government, is all reasons behind our competitiveness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why it is easy to engage our business community uh, in this international agenda. Yeah, uh, yeah go on, Akina. Yeah, I was going to bring you in. That, I mean, for us, in, the, in terms of all the investments that we make, uh, there's a compliance side of it for all of our investments that we make. Uh, we look at environmental and social impact assessment for all of our investments. So that's on the compliance side. But also on the supply side of financing. Uh, we have clients that come to us, countries that come to us, they want to invest in renewable energy, for example, solar panels in particular countries and stuff like that, or geothermal power plants. Um, and so we also post uh, green bonds to be able to actually get a lot more capital to do that. And that allowed us, for example, to support Sierra Leone uh, to build its <coughs> largest uh, you know, power plant. It is, it's, it's small, but for them it's big. It's 33 megawatts because of, of, of that financing. But an area that I see as a huge opportunity 
where we have to actually crowd in a lot of financing. It's on renewable energy generally in Africa. Um, if you take, for example, uh, the companies that are doing distributed energy in Africa today, they don't have access to financing at affordable rate because the market is still small um, and then the, the risk is still high and they can only get access to commercial financing which is very, very expensive. So what we've done at the African Development Bank is we've just set up a fund that's a $400 million fund uh, which allow us to provide financing to them at um, uh, unblended finance to be able to get it at a lower rate uh, so that you can accelerate uh, companies that are doing renewable energy but at a smaller scale. They are doing less than 30 megawatts. So these are the kind of companies that find it difficult to raise money uh, uh, from other investors. So I think that we need to customize instruments uh, on the supply side but also on the demand side. Just to finish up on the demand side, um, you know, as you were mentioning the issue of the last mile in, uh, uh, in India, this works also for renewable energy as well. You find that people want to put up their solar, single solar panel PVs, but they can't afford to pay the, the, the upfront cost. Right? So we provide financing that allows us to be able to stretch that, that it can pay over many years. So on the supply side, you're pushing renewable energy, but on the demand side, you're also making it easy to get consumer credit that allows them to invest in the single solar panel PV systems. Chet, now I can see you want to say something. Go on. Yeah, I just want to add two things. One is that one big challenge which we see uh, is that how, uh, as I mentioned about the cocoons, that how this whole industry, the artisans, the craft and all that, how it is dying just because there is not enough access to finance. And here I'm talking about access to finance not to get the loan and repayment, but it's about like regular capital flow is required. And I mean, uh, revenue capital flow is required. And our banks do not have that product. So why can't we have those type of bonds, which are bonds for the artisans, which would require that type of finance? We are Anyway, we are going to launch the second fund will be for that. But I just want to bring that in the debate that it's not only just providing and finance and access to finance to artisan, but also to cultivating and uh, have those traditions of silk or you know other looms and looms, all that. That is one. And second, which I actually would like to extend about what you made a very important point about the solar. Like country like India has so much of solar energy. And we are losing out just because we are not enough innovative. Why can't we have a bonds or you know unlock a private capital for the human invest in human capital? And how can we do that? I mean, we have so much ideas that when we want to conserve water, we want water engineers who are a local community. We can invest in them. I am on one billion dollar fund as an advisor, which is from the government but which will create the ecosystem for such things which we cannot put it but the, as a public organization or as a government has this so these are the things which again how can we have a water engineers how can we have a soil doctors in the rural area this and we have to invest to train them and that capital also has to come because we want to invest a human capital for the sustainable development goals mm -hmm. Sure. Right. That gentleman there had a question. If you could pass him the microphone. Yeah, just in the, uh, the, all the panelists have more or less touched. Hang on. on. Could you say who oh, you are I'm and Tristram where you're from? Stewart. I'm a young global leader. Um, so the panel have uh, more or less touched on it. But when we talk about impact investment, uh, there's a dominant paradigm in this kind of mega global trend where, um, uh, as it's been said, there isn't a trade off between returns and uh, getting a good impact. And I, I totally see the function of that paradigm. That's how the big capital is going to come into this sector. But there's another function that this impact investment trend can and I, I think should uh, really be focused. And we don't want to overpromise. There are lots of areas where finance is needed, where the return is a trade-off or where the risk is just much greater. And that, that should be a function that we should cultivate and not kind of sidelined by the, the idea of um, not, not ever having a trade-off and just Anecdotally, I have created a company. We upcycle waste bread into beer. We put all of our dividends into charity. We're offering pretty punchy uh, capital gains to our investors. But you know, there's no point in even talking to the funds. Nevertheless, it's been hugely easy to raise a million quid from individuals, which suggests there's an appetite, a strong appetite out there for people who want 
They want to take a risk. They don't need exactly the same returns they'd normally expect. They just want to have some epic impact in the world. And uh, I just inviting that sort of, what is yeah. the function of impact investment? in? in yeah, Philip, is there, I mean, is there room for that kind of product? Yes, I, I think uh, I, I totally agree with you, and which is why I mentioned it. Um, I don't think one excludes the other, on the contrary. And, and as I suggested, I believe that with this generational wealth transfer, which is not talked about very often, but the numbers are enormous. And if it's true that, you know, values evolve as generations evolve, I think it's very, very important to, to make that point as well, to say there may well be cases where um, the pure financial returns may decline, but you're creating, you know, societal values, which is sort of why we've, our CEO has uh, coined this term, which is trying to capture this, you know, sustained financial performance. And the notion here is, uh, or I guess the, the crisis analogy would be risk-adjusted returns. If we can reduce the risk of migration, if we can reduce the risk of extreme popular politics, of civil wars, which often are related to environmental crisis, for instance, then I think you know, that's an improvement in sustained financial performance, even if the actual kind of rate of return may go down. And I just want to say, you know, a lot of people quote here Milton Friedman from an article in the 70s where he said famously, the business of business is business. And most people, of course, never go and read this article. What they forget is when you read the article, Milton Friedman also talked about societal values. He's, he talks about the fact that, of course, companies have to operate within societal values. And if they don't, their societal license to operate gets withdrawn. And I think this points exactly to what you're saying, that as these values evolve in societies, uh, I think there's lots of demand for people who want to invest and accept, in fact, purely financially, perhaps a slightly lower rate of return. Uh, and then, of course, government has a big role to play. You know, in some of these problems that you're facing, uh, the financial returns may be significantly lower, and that's where governments have to come in and create the right incentives, cover perhaps some first loss protection, this is not, I don't think we should be naive here. This is not a problem, particularly in the developing world, that can be solved entirely by the, by the private sector. I'm a firm believer that, you know, governments, particularly in the sort of, in the extreme cases, uh, I was with a lady from Chad the other day, you know, talking about an extreme case, uh, government policies will have to come in to support this. Uh, private capital alone cannot be uh, the solution for those cases. Just to say, um, I mean, what you were saying is quite interesting because um, I interview all the time company, company bosses, quite young entrepreneurs, founders of companies, and I have noticed there's a real sort of surge in young people who are creating companies not to just purely make profits, that's not their motivation at all actually. They're making profits obviously to, to run as a f company and function, but almost to be like a social enterprise actually. Um, social enterprise is, is almost like a sort of buzzword. Um, and that's sort of what Larry Fink, your chief executive, was, was trying to discuss. But what response did he get to that report from, from corporates who he was sort of trying to encourage to think in those terms. Well, I would assume that there was a bias. Those who liked it told us, and perhaps those who didn't like it so much didn't tell us. Um, but Do we you feel it's falling? I mean, you know, what appetite is there for it, though? Because here at the World Economic Forum, you know, we're sort of... Everybody's Look, for us, an important part is talent. Page. I think great companies that over time will sustain great financial performance need great people particularly in an industry where, in our industry, where human resources is really, that's it. You know, we don't have factories and we don't have big machines, and so it's people. And one of the things that is very clear, um, that again, our, the average age of BlackRock is 35, so I'm, I'm old. I'm no longer a young leader, certainly. <laughs> Neither young nor a leader, but, uh, and it is tremendous what you can generate in terms of people wanting to work at companies that have what Larry calls a social purpose. You know, that doesn't mean, we're, we're a listed company, we're highly commercial, we're demanding, but when people begin to feel that it's not a narrow definition of profitability, 
Uh, the effect this has on talent, I can tell you, is extraordinary. The same with diversity, by the way. Diversity is very hard to implement. We know that. But when companies, when, when people start to believe that their company actually mean it, the effect it has on the ability to attract talent, which is ultimately the key, I think, decisive factor in terms of whether you're going to be successful or not in the long term, I think is remarkable. And, and I, I tell you from experience, we have seen this uh, and the war for talent, after all, is perhaps the most challenging thing we face in terms of being successful in the long term. Let's see if we've got some more questions because we've got about 10 minutes to go now. So if you would like to sort of channel the discussion in a certain direction or talk about a particular issue, we've got a, a lady at the back there. Could you rem remember to say who you are and where you're from? I'm Neha Kirpal. I'm based in India. I'm a the young, young Global Leader. Uh, my question is uh, with a specific focus on mental health. So I know obviously there's a lot of healthcare uh, investment broadly, but uh, at least from where I come from, mental health is typically regarded as a rather unattractive uh, investment uh, option by the private sector. And the government uh, somehow hasn't brought it into focus for the scale of the epidemic that it now is. Uh, and so I would just love comments about how all of you look at mental health as, um, as, as you know, an impact uh, investment opportunity, and um, and what you know, what kind of for-profit and not-for-profit models may you consider um, uh, that that you know of, or that you may consider worthwhile, um, and that are relevant to solve the problem at the scale that at the systemic scale that it is today. Thank you. Who would like to respond to that? That's quite a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, mental health is not something that's easy to measure or easy to see uh, an outcome, is it? It's quite tricky, uh, that whole issue. In the UK, we're seeing a lot of momentum when it comes to talking about it, certainly within the workplace as well, actually. Uh, and that's to do with a lot of high-profile people taking this on board, like uh, Prince Harry, for example. There's one ambassador for mental health and... William and Kate, if I can talk to, about them in those terms. Um, but would anybody like to respond to that? It's quite a tricky one, isn't it? We've talked a lot about <coughs> practical issues, climate, yeah. agriculture, farming, poverty, women. What about mental health? I mean, it has been a taboo in our own society for many, many years. So, uh, uh, But as you just mentioned, I think we have overcome it uh, and, and we are working on that agenda as well. How, how we can implement it in this... Uh, Strategy. I must admit, I have never really given it a thought before. But any Chetna? Yeah. Actually, first of all, I I really congratulate. I mean, I really liked that you raised this question in this panel. It is so important, and so I'm glad that you raised it. That is first. Second, I would like to say that uh, there are many organisations which are working in mental health, and I when I observe those organisations. It is the whole organization has to struggle so much, not only just, I don't want to describe that, everybody knows it, on getting the investment on uh, support on one side and then working with the, and it's not only just finance is an issue there, there are so many other issues. So how the finance can come in, I do believe that uh, in that case actually, there has to be a passionate private capital. You need to have that. There is no question and I think that, I mean, I'm just, I know that I'm not suggesting that, okay, we are starting something like that, but why can't we have a passionate private capital because this is the area where those, pe those communities are teaching us to have a less egos, to have like be humble, mm -hmm. which is actually going to help us if we do that. Mm -hmm. We'll be create, creating a much better society, so yeah. I'm just like... Anyway. And akin, I mean, in Africa, it's difficult, isn't it, when you've got so much... Uh, practical issues right in front of you, you know, serious malnutrition, yeah. uh, climate, agriculture. I mean, mental health will just be low down on the list, I assume, well, I, for I, I, wrong I, or right, you know. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to talk just about mental health. I, I think health in general, um, you know, all the way from nutrition, uh, dealing with malaria, for example, uh, in Africa, it's a big, it's a big issue. Uh, HIV AIDS, access to drugs and things like that are big issues. So, but I think that the same principles apply, you know, to your point. These are areas in which the private sector will not invest in. But we know that for whole collective good of all of us as human beings, we need to invest in those areas. 
So that's where our government needs to come in. So if it has to be in terms of how you have mental care support facilities and how they can be supported, in terms of medication and access to that, how that can be supported. And those kind of companies that want to take on those kind of things, how does government give them some kind of tax incentives to be able to do it? All that will make uh, uh, make case. But I do want to say something about what you were saying about the young people. Uh, because I think it's an area in which we should actually have um, a lot more focus on impact investing. Take, for example, Europe today. You've got lots of African young people get on boats, rickety boats, and follow them on the Mediterranean Sea. And as president of the African Development Bank, I see them on hard breaks. And yet, I know their future is not in Europe. Their future is also not at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. So future actually has to be in Africa, where you, they, can, they can take their ideas, they can be entrepreneurial, and get the financing to turn their great ideas into great businesses. And so for us at the African Development Bank, we're taking a big step on this. Uh, we've launched a major program to help African countries to create 25 million jobs over the next 10 years. That's going to be in the ICT sector, it's going to be small and medium-sized enterprises, but also in the agriculture sector. I've got here a vice president, for example, for agriculture uh, at the African Development Bank, and also my vice president for private sector, uh, Pierre Guslain and, and Jennifer here. What we are trying to do is this. As a bank, we've got to put our capital to risk for the young people. A young person walks into a bank, or to a private equity firm. I, I have a great, great idea, I need money. Nobody's gonna think they, they, their ideas are ever going to thrive. Well, they told Bill Gates that also, and look at him today. And so what we are trying to do is set up a fund in which we can say, here is a grant facility, for the first phase of your business, you have a takeoff. And the next phase of your business, have a, a, an equity that can go into that and allow your business to, uh, uh, to grow. Then in the third stage of your business, when you built a, 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 a cash flow history, then you can begin then to have risk sharing facilities that allows the banks then to be able to lend to them. But I really believe that we've got to really begin to look at how to get impact investing into allowing young people uh, to thrive with their ideas and build entrepreneurship. And, and, and I can't think of anything more important uh, for us than to do that. Okay, we are almost out of time. So what I'd like to do now is ask each panelist to tell me uh, what is the most important thing that you feel uh, we need to do in terms of moving forward to see more social impact investment in terms, in the light of our discussion in the last hour. I know that's quite tricky. <laughs> and then we will conclude. So... <laughs> You're passing it on. Oh, no, no, All right, I'll we'll come be, to you last, shall one. we? Yeah. We'll, we'll come to you last. So, Chetna, do you want to go first? Okay. The one most important thing. In a short sentence, please. Yes, sure. The most important thing, I believe, is that listen to people, listen to women, and listen to communities. I know that uh, they, are, they have a vision of uh, achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, they have the solutions. Philip. Look, I, I guess I would say the most important thing that we face as humanity is that f from a financial perspective, that finance can be an important, not the only one, but an important catalyst of change uh, in terms of climate change. Because it seems to me that, again, I'm not a scientist, but it seems to me fairly clear that if we don't, if we can't rapidly uh, create an improvement at least, change the trajectory around climate change, then everything else becomes unbelievably difficult if manageable at all. Uh, if you have no water in large parts of Africa or India, then you know all the capital in the world isn't really going to change that. So I think if we really think at, about first order problems um, to try to create the structure so that finance can be an important catalyst of change in terms of climate change. All that right. seems to me the most important challenge. Super. We've got about 30 seconds. Akin. Well, I think that to, to solve Africa's uh, big challenges, we need a lot of, of capital. And, and that's why the African Development Bank is we're launching this year, uh, 7 to the 9th of November, what's called the Africa Investment Forum. It is to take all the global pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds, and the ones in Africa, de-risk them so they can invest in energy, power, water, roads. All I'm trying to say is that 
the biggest impact will come when the capital actually gets the risk to go to where it needs to go. And finally, Prime Minister. Yeah, I would say just stay focused because this is a good cause. And whether you use your brain or your heart, you reach the same conclusion. And that what fills me with optimism. For instance, talking about aid to Africa, uh, uh, decades ago it would have been some people for idealistic reasons. Now it is in, and it has always been, but it is in a common interest. So even though people, those people who are not as idealistic as others, if they use their brain instead of just feeling with their heart, they will reach the same conclusion. There's no alternative to solving these problems. I'd like to thank all our panelists. We've gone over by about 47 seconds, so I think we've done rather well. Okay. And thank you so much too.